lately just in the world it seems like we're in a time of upheaval and I wanted you to touch briefly on the idea of the honorable harvest and it seems like a wonderful antidote for our current time and the way that we're just going through resources so quickly and if you could just tell our listeners a bit about that and then how would our lives change if this was a more common practice to follow sure um this idea of the honorable harvest is based in all the things that we have been talking about so far. This idea of respect for individuals in the living world as persons, that we don't eat them, we call them by name, we recognize them as our family. But that sets up an ethical dilemma, doesn't it? Because that means we're going to be eating our family, <laughs> right? <laughs> Basically. And so if in the Western world where we just say, well, it's it, it's not our family, it's just stuff, it's property, it belongs to us. We can deal with it any way we want. But when we recognize the personhood of all beings, it means that as we consume, as we have to consume, um, we do it with honor and we do it with mindfulness of how we take from the living world. And these protocols for how we take from the living world are part of every indigenous and land-based local culture that I know, that there are guidelines of self-restraint for how we take from the world. And the honorable harvest includes the notion of never take the first one. You stop and reflect on the nature of this gift that's being offered you. Not stuff, not property, but a gift that's being given to you. And you don't take the first one. You demur and go on to be sure that there's three or four or more or a hundred that you don't take until you know that there's enough to share. And we always say that the honorable harvest includes asking permission. Asking permission of that tree or those berries or those roots that uh, could you share those with me to engage those plants as 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 beings as 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 persons, and then really evaluating listening for the answer if you ask, is there enough to share? Could I have some of that? You then have to use your human gifts to hear that answer, and they might be science gifts. They might be a way of, of, of judging the size of that population, measuring its viability, its vigor, to know whether there's enough to share, reading the landscape. It could also be intuitive gifts and spiritual gifts to be able to listen to the answer, to say, yeah, is it okay if I take these? And if the answer is no, then you just don't take them. We also say that the honorable harvest is, again, self-restraint. You never take more than half. And the prescription is that you take only what you need. Take as little as, as you can to, to meet your needs. So different than the dominant <laughs> paradigm of be efficient, take everything that you can get at the, at the least possible cost. The honorable harvest continues, don't waste what you've taken. Share everything that you've taken minimize harm in the way that you take, offer gratitude for what you've received, and then most importantly, to reciprocate the gift. In return for what we've been given, give something back. And this is both a spiritual practice and a material practice, which are rooted firmly, honestly, in the laws of thermodynamics. You can't just keep taking without replenishing. That's not how the world works. And so these are some of the elements of the, of the honorable harvest, which are these ancient protocols that lead to this idea that if we sustain the living world by the honorable harvest, the living world can continue to sustain us. It's hmm. wonderful. And we find ourselves now because we have just been taking, you know, with some giving, but a lot of taking. And I feel like we're at this point now um, with climate change, our crisis with climate change. Um, do you believe that plants hold particular lessons for us in this era of climate change? And do they hold a key to a possible solution to climate change through photosynthesis? 
Oh, absolutely. I think they do. Um, you know, when we hear about um, all of these solutions for carbon sequestration and coming up with, <laughs> you know, with technological solutions to do that, um, I, I don't want to be dismissive of technological innovation. But honestly, that alone is not going to get us where we need to be. It's got to be, we can't just metaphorically change light bulbs. We have to change ourselves as well um, and our and our worldview and our understanding of our, our place in the world. And the good thing is we've got plants to teach us that. When you think about the biomimicry of what plants have to teach us about dealing with accelerating climate chaos, you just look at them and, and realize that they have already converted to a 100% solar economy, right? Mm -hmm. um, there they are, um, creating food, medicine, fuel, all of these things on a solar economy in great, great um, diversity, um, that they build soil rather than deplete it. They filter water. They, you know, they sequester carbon. They store it. They make beauty. Um, they, they cool us down. Plants make it rain by interacting in this reciprocal way with the hydrologic cycle. So, yeah, I think we have some pretty good teachers out there of how we might adapt to, to climate change by looking at how the plants do it, that we need to invest as much in protecting the flourishing and, of plants and increasing the flourishing of plants as we do with our technological solutions. Mm -hmm. I do also have to say, though, that reforestation, investment in, in both in forest, in the carbon sequestration that's possible in good, rich, fertile soils, for example, these things that are taught us by plants, some of the climate models do tell us, though, that, that reforestation and investment in plants is a big part of where we need to go, but that it isn't enough. We have so created this surplus of, of, of carbon dioxide inputs without carbon dioxide absorption by natural communities that we're going to need other solutions as well, which include, of course, um, uh, reduced consumption, reduced production of, of, of carbon dioxide through a, a transition to renewable energy. And that's where I could see how the marriage of science, science technology and indigenous wisdom, it really can come together and come up with solutions. Absolutely. And so we're getting close to the end of our time um, together. And one question I had was, how can we honor the people and cultures that have so much to teach us about how to live lightly and lovingly on the planet? And how can we apply indigenous ecological knowledge in a respectful way without participating in cultural appropriation? Such an important question. Um, and I thank you for for asking that. One of the things which is so important is to recognize that our connections to the earth come from paying attention to the earth and participating in in the cycles of, of living, right? And to recognize that the earth feeds all of us and, and where I'm going with this is to try and remember that while indigenous societies provide us with models and inspiration of how we might live, that our job is not to be borrowing or appropriating from native cultures, but in fact to come with authentic relationships to our own places in a cultural context which is meaningful to the practitioner, to you. Um, I think it's so important that we live with honor, with gratitude, with reciprocity, with reverence. Um, and we do that by creating authentic relationships with, with the land ourselves. That is at root most meaningful, to really come to inhabit our home places, whether they be in the midst of a city or in the desert or in the 
hills, mountains, you know, to live deliberately, right? To live as if our grandparents' ashes were in that land. Um, to live as if this is the place where our descendants will or will not flourish. To live as if that river is going to be our life source from these days forward. Um, and it's that authentic engagement with place and participation in the reciprocal exchanges with your place that allow us to live lovingly and lightly, as you as you said so beautifully, without cultural appropriation, but with creation of authentic relationships. 